Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this uh, section here, I'm going to talk about uh, some masonry investigations, and specifically I'm going to talk about the Masonry Society's Disaster Investigation Program. And uh, this has been going on for... Is that a little better? <laughs> this has been going on for some time. Uh, the, uh, I'm the current uh, chair of this program. Uh, you can see listed here some of the, some of the uh, disasters that uh, the Masonry Society has sent professionals to investigate right after the event. And uh, we try to learn from masonry. The idea is to try to make masonry better and uh, to try to understand what has happened and uh, what failure modes are in the field and, and, uh, and you know, should we have expected that behavior to happen or not. And so uh, uh, I'm going to mention some of the things from these uh, reports that are relevant to historical masonry. Uh, in general, it's, it's always interesting when you actually go on one of these. Uh, I've been on some myself, and uh, uh, you, you never know what to expect. This is one from when I went to Hurricane Katrina, and uh, you, know, you see signs like this and you wonder. Uh, all right, the uh, investigation methods we use in the disaster investigation program are very similar to what any architect and or engineer would do when they walk up to any building with limited information because we're faced with a wide array of buildings, very interesting stories, uh, but not all of the data is evident. So we have to follow leads from multiple sources to try to find out which structures we want to look at, and that's done through local contacts. Uh, we have visual observation and photographs on the site, uh, which is common sense. We, we do try to record the basic information and we interview personnel that's available on site. We don't spend a whole lot of time on any one of these sites because there's a lot of ground to cover usually and just getting there is half the fun. Uh, the, uh, we measure properties of the uh, uh, structures. Uh, we can use you know, laser, uh, uh, laser dimensions. Uh, we have uh, portable rebar detectors. Um, I have a Ferriscan, a handheld Hilti PS200 Ferriscan, which is excellent. Uh, it's, it's about $5,000, but I use it all the time. Uh, you go into historical masonry and you want to know if something's reinforced or not. That's one way to find out. And it's a handheld device that you can roll over. It's got induction coils that can sense the, the rebar in there. So uh, you also use it to, can, you can use it to identify ties, like in a masonry veneer. Sometimes you don't know if it's a veneer or if it's a low bearing system uh, when you just walk up not knowing anything else about the structure. So uh, for example, if you have a tie at one location and you have a metal detector, you can, uh, it's point, if it's point focused, you can, uh, you can run the device around the center of the, uh, where you're getting the blip on your, on your device that there's metal there. If you run around it and you don't get a blip, that means that that's likely a tie. And if you get that on a grid of some kind of logical pattern, that means it's likely an anchored tie that's uh, anchored back to a backup system and not, not structural. Uh, historically, uh, some of those were considered structural, however, so just because you have ties doesn't mean it's non is non structural. The uh, uh, yeah, we also consider collecting samples. Sometimes uh, you can obtain samples of a mortar, uh, uh, and then you can um, take it back to a lab for a petrographic analysis, where they look at look at it under an electron microscope, and from that they can tell that the chemical compounds. Uh, spectral analysis, you know, can tell if it's a uh, lime sand mortar or if it's a cement-based mortar, for example. Uh, the, uh, also, we can flag some of these for further investigation. Some of these have actually been done in combination. Yes, sir? Can we ask questions? Sure, on? sure. On the third item at the bottom, where it's portable rebar detector to locate rebar and ties, mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And we'll get more into, in a few minutes, uh, the probes, uh, how we will remove masonry units and then look ourselves, and then we'll replace those units in our investigations because there's no replacement for a visual observation of the actual tie itself. Exactly. Great question. Uh, Hurricane Opal, uh, we looked at uh, the effectiveness of the breakaway walls to control damage from storm surge. I'm sure people here on this, uh, in Brownsville are very familiar with this uh, system. Uh, you know, there's uh, importance of connections. You know, Andreas touched on this, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll reinforce that, that, uh, you know, structural engineering is as much, if not more, about the connections 
than it is about the design of the actual members themselves. All right, because the failure of the connections is the most common problem in any of the load path. And uh, here you can see you have, uh, uh, without a connection, the diaphragm blew off. Uh, and from each of these investigations, recommendations are implemented in the, into the code and the current into the practice. Uh, in Nisqually, there was an earthquake in 2001. You know, I don't, I guess you can see it up there. You can see how, let's use this uh, laser pointer. You can see that there was a parapet that extends above the roof level. And uh, because of a lack of connection to the roof diaphragm, this part was, was pe peeled away. And this part on the sides stayed because of the resistance in, inherent in the returning around that corner. Uh, through these investigations, a lot of times we'll identify uh, unreinforced masonry parapets. And the code actually, because of a lot of our investigations, has uh, in the IEBC spelled out some approaches of retrofitting those unreinforced parapets because they're highly uh, likely to collapse, uh, fail, uh, and bend away, uh, especially with mortar erosion. And you'll, you'll notice that we've not only braced the top of the parapet, we've also bra attached it to the roof diaphragm, which is the, one of the principal problems with historic masonry. You'll find wood joists just sitting in a pocket. And so the dead load of the roof is the only thing through friction that allows that connection to be successful. In Ohio, there were tornadoes, and uh, from that, for example, we found uh, uh, the importance of masonry safe rooms, and, and uh, those are used, uh, there are guidelines in FEMA on designing safe rooms, and sometimes in historical buildings that are rehabilitated to, to a, a use where there's a, a lot of occupancy in them, uh, you will, uh, especially if it's like a city hall structure or a firehouse, you can put safe rooms in there to find a balance between uh, historical preservation and also safety because a, a safe room can be designed such that the building around it could fall to pieces, but the people inside would be protected. Uh, Hurricane Charlie, uh, again, importance of diaphragm connections. So I'm gonna spend some time on two, two uh, hurricanes uh, that are more recent, Hurricane Ivan and Hurricane Katrina. Both of these were not high wind speed events. Andreas mentioned the change in the building code from the 2010 version of the building code, uh, the ASCE load code, which is referenced by the 2012 IBC relative to what was referenced by the 2009 IBC. So I don't know what Brownsville is under right now today, but being this being uh, you know, so recent that it's probable that uh, most of the areas around here have not gone to the 2012 IBC yet. When you do, be full well aware that the wind speeds, the language of wind speeds has changed. And it's very subtle because it's the same wording so the only thing that's going to tell you the difference is so you, you're very clear about which code you're referencing. 2012 IBC references the ASCE 7-10 from 2010. So for example, uh, today under the 2009 IBC, you might design for 110 mile an hour wind somewhere, whereas it may be 170 mile an hour wind that you're designing for, and it's the same load, okay? And the only reason that's the same load is because we've changed the load factor. We bump up that load from 1.6, now it's 1.0. All right, so we've redefined what service load is for winds. And that's significant because if you remember, we evaluate the safety of structures under service loads. So this is uh, the typical data we get from these hurricanes where you see the three second gust wind speed. Some of you may remember a change from fastest mile measurement method of wind speed to three second gust. And you may remember some of the headaches and some of the unsafe things that happened by accident by people not being well informed about that process. That I, I predict that that same thing is gonna happen again as we go from the 2009 to the 2010, uh, 10, excuse me, 2009 to the 2012 version of the same conversation, taking the same terminology and changing the numbers to mean something the same. The effect of uh, sheltering by adjacent structures I, th I think is fascinating when you look at these structures in the field. Uh, this building here is a strip mall, and this parapet, it was several feet high, and it was a single masonry wide, no backing whatsoever. Just somebody laid brick up high. And you can see how it, how it, how it failed here, but it did not fail over here. I would have thought that that would have failed everywhere in a hurricane. The reason is because all of this was protected by a structure that was about 20 feet away in front of it. And so even though you can have a hurricane, the effects of shielding are phenomenal. And that's why a lot of historical structures have survived. So when you find as you develop and you remove a forest of trees next to a courthouse, you may find that courthouse may not survive the next hurricane. 
you can see the drastic difference in materials uh, with, with the studies uh, in the field. You can see, for example, uh, the difference in material, but also the architecture of this solid masonry wall building that lasted, even though it was taller and had openings. This had the mesh inside of it, very resistant, very redundant structure. Whereas this was an unreinforced, ungrouted concrete masonry structure with a very lightly loaded roof. So the, so, and it had a large opening in it. Very different architecture. All of those things are working against this structure, but all of the things that are in this are working for it. Why it would survive? So all masonry was not created equal. Adjacent structures uh, can shelter. This is a, a great historic area. This is in uh, Pensacola. Uh, a lot of these pictures from Ivan R. And you can see structure after structure after structure, they shelter each other. They also lean on each other. There's a, a, lot of, a lot of redundancy there. On the other side of the street, the same street, you can see how the, the, the very well-known Sarah's building had a large catastrophe when this side of the building, uh, triple wide, you know, three layers thick, peeled away because of the leeward pressures. When wind whips around a building, it, the, the back of the building will get suction pressure as the wind is, uh, there's a vacuum. And, uh, and so what you can find as you look close is there was a uh, very nominal, there's no real connection between the floor diaphragms, which act just like roof diaphragms in Dr. Stavridis' example, to, to the walls. So it just peeled away. Uh, down the street and around the corner where the windward face was, uh, you can see, I, I, to me, this is a great picture. <laughs> Y'all may not see what I see, but this is capturing in action a, an unreinforced masonry flexural failure. It's failing, failing in bending. And there was, a, a, there was a, a piece of uh, weightlifting equipment behind it that kept this brace so it didn't completely fall down to the ground. But that's what it looks like when it buckles, you know, because of bending out of plane. This is uh, are also all kinds of other examples, unreinforced and unbraced chimneys uh, failing, unreinforced masonry cantilevered landscaping pilasters failing, hazards uh, can be adjacent trees. You can see the, the trees all snapped and fell down on the structure. So you, you can do everything you want to the building itself. Sometimes it's everything around the building that's the problem. Uh, you can have uh, anchors failing due to corrosion. Uh, you mentioned the, the condition of the anchors. In this case, you can see right here that the, the anchor had, had corroded, even though it was a galvanized tie that would have been acceptable by building code. The uh, hazards can be adjacent buildings themselves. Uh, these uh, steel stud elements were projectiles from a 20-story building across the street. And uh, when the wind pulled them off of that building, they flew down and they destroyed this historic building which otherwise probably would have lasted. Here's a good example of, a, of an unreinforced masonry building and how it performs under wind. There was a large opening on that wall, and uh, the wind pressure entered the building, and it pushed up, and it blew the roof diaphragm off, and nothing was bracing these unreinforced walls, and so this fell to the side as the wind pressure inside built up, and it pushed out. It kind of looks like a bomb went off, you could say. And, uh, and then, then the wind pressure pushed on this, uh, roof diaphragm, and you can see how it slid along those, uh, those masonry unreinforced joints. Uh, the bed joints are what they're called, the bed of the unit. And you can see this, all these units here are the pieces of the bond beam. It had no rebar in it. And so if it's got no, bar, no bars at all, it really cannot take tension. That's the, that's the one thing you need to know if you're going to leave this seminar today and you don't know it. Uh, storm surge is very commonly known. It's a, it's a how do you deal with storm surge? <laughs> Other than breakaway walls, it's going to completely destroy anything in its path, really. And uh, uh, that's something you see over and over again. So Hurricane Katrina, uh, again, like Ivan, it's very well known. It's much more well known than Ivan, but uh, it, it, it was a, a low wind speed event. Uh, the wind speeds here were similar to Ivan. They were, you know, 95, 100 miles an hour, whereas uh, that's what anywhere in the center of the country has to design per the 05 code and it's going to be even higher in the 010 code if you think about those nominal service winds. So, so uh, uh, you can look and you can see the effects of storm surge when Katrina were widespread. Uh, it just puts everything to rubble debris. Uh, there are some structures that, interestingly enough, will survive, and this is a, a nice historic masonry building that uh, uh, survived very well. There are uh, problems with connections at foundations, typically, with unreinforced masonry structures. It's thought that there's no tension capacity, and here you see that the actual the foundation here lasted, but the, everything above it was, was wiped off the foundation. This is an example I like to, to point out because it catches in the action the uplift. Uh, you can see where the, uh, there was a bolt 
It's just, this is, this is load path 101, right? You've got the joists that took the tension, and you've got this unit that was, was connected by an anchor bolt, but there was no rebar connecting that to the rest of the bond beam, okay? So it just lifted that unit right up. This is, uh, this is something that's personally meaningful to me. Uh, I, as a kid, I drove by this historical restaurant in uh, Bay St. Louis and Pastor Christiane all my life, every 4th of July when we'd go visit. And it was a landmark of the area. Uh, these nice, this nice uh, archway that uh, defined the front of the restaurant and uh, completely destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. Uh, you can see wind damage uh, due to lack of connections. And uh, uh, you can find uh, uh, re reinforcement that has no grout in it sometimes with more modern structures. And, and that's relevant to historical masonry when you think about retrofits that have been done over the years. Were they done properly? Here's an example of a wall you walk up, you drive up, and you see something, you, what, what, where'd the wall go? And it's on the ground, and it just completely failed because there were no connections. A lot of times, architects will specify certain elements of a building to be designed by an engineer, but not have, a engineer of rec have, have an engineer record on the entire project. And that's where you can find scope uh, gaps, where you have a truss engineer that designs the trusses, you may have a, a foundation engineer that designs a foundation. You may even have a, a, a wall detail, but there's no connection that was done at, at some point in that process. This is an example of how uh, even though you specify rebar, you don't always get rebar in a grouted cell. And it doesn't do its job if it's not in a grouted cell, okay? So if you look at the codes changing uh, over the years, we're much more reliant on field observation rather than testing. We don't require mortar cube testing. That's one of the common misunderstandings I see about new construction masonry standards for construction testing. We do not require mortar cube testing. If you'd like to talk more about that, I can. Uh, the uh, veneers coming off, you can see uh, it doesn't do any good if it's not installed in the brick. You can see you have veneers, veneer anchors that are just flat up against the wall, right? Uh, this is a, uh, a Catholic uh, parish with a school in, uh, in the, it, that was hit by Katrina, and you can see that was their main sanctuary where the walls were just ripped apart. And that was because the, the anchors connecting these two Ys were completely co corroded through everywhere. And they just snapped with uh, the, the, the wind when they finally received some real wind. And they didn't have the sheltering effects. And uh, uh, you can see the corrosion of a galvanized anchor. Uh, when they're embedded in the cementitious material, you'll find that commonly. When, when you have corrosion uh, concerns, you know, if it's exposed to earth, weather, you know, if the humidity is greater than 75 degrees, uh, uh, 75 percent, uh, you know, it's required to have stainless, hot dip galvanized or epoxy coated, you know, anchorages. You know, for all other cases, uh, well, that's actually wrong. It says mill galvanized. That should be uh, not hot, not, not, mill galvanized is the thinner galvanized. That, it should be hot dip galvanized. Uh, I apologize. I just noticed that. <laughs> uh, Katrina survivor, uh, and I, I like this building uh, because you, it shows good load path and conservative um, design structurally. You have small openings spaced far apart. You've got a box configuration, and it's, in a, and it's in a vicinity where it's sheltered by other adjacent structures that aren't likely to damage it. So I can see why it would survive. Whereas you, you can have this, this building where uh, it was designed, uh, it's uh, still an unreinforced masonry building, but it wasn't designed like 100 years ago. This is more like 50 years ago. And you can see 50 years ago, people started pushing the limits because look at how large this opening is compared to that Katrina survivor we just looked at and how small the jams are because people wanted that nice view. They wanted that nice uh, daylight. And the, the problem is with no reinforcement in this wall system, when wind breaks through these windows and causes uplift on that roof system, there's absolutely nothing to anchor that down. And so the whole roof system just got pulled off. This is also a good example of cracking in the parapets. Uh, very common in unreinforced masonry systems. And those would need to be repointed where they ground out, they grind out the mortar and install new fresh mortar at a minimum if you're not going to brace it and reinforce it. It's always funny when you, when you come up to odd situations uh, without realizing it. You know, I spent some time trying to figure this one out. What, why did that fail? Because of Katrina, I was thinking of that storm surge. But then I, I stepped back and I realized this is a barge. That's a casino barge. <laughs> All right, and that casino barge uh, is shown here in an aerial image, and that's the building that, that this thing hit that building and then floated and sunk over there. So you, know, you never know what to expect when you go to these, look at these investigations. Uh, sometimes historical masonry, it's interesting that people have tried things, 
as they were building buildings 100 years ago, they, they were trying to develop technology. I've, I've seen all kinds of crazy homemade braces. And uh, uh, here's an example where they were using reinforcement, but they didn't carry it through with a load path. So the rebar actually here was terrible because this top course got pulled off, but the rebar held it. So it was like a whip whipping around, and it bat battered the roof of this building. And so during the hurricane, they couldn't get those fire trucks out. There are other types of construction that we're not de delving into. Uh, here's steel stud construction with a, uh, a thin adhered veneer. And I mention it because if you had not seen this, if you had seen this before the hurricane, you might thought, have thought that this was an original historical piece. It's got archways, it's got millwork, it's in a nice historical area, but, but this, is a, this is just a thin adhered veneer, and so the failure of the connection behind it is gonna cause the fail, failure. So that might be something in a reconstruction project where you're trying to give the appearance of something historic. And then this is my last slide where I'll show you uh, the, uh, I show you this slide because it illustrates what, what, uh, what Andreas mentioned, which is my old masonry professor, who was your masonry professor too, right? Rich Klingner, yeah? <laughs> uh, he said the communist manifesto of structural engineering is everything in proportion to its stiffness, right? And so. The masonry here being a stiff element was trying to take the load as this large ductile steel element was trying to bend over. So while the thing did not fail, and the steel element did not fail, the masonry failed in, in the, because it took all the load until it gave way and then allowed that redistribution of stresses.